Hello everyone. Good evening. Welcome. Very happy to see you all here. And very happy to be hosting a good friend and distinguished speaker, Michael Damberg, who has had pretty much every important job you could have in Sweden, uh, including the most important job of them all, which is, of course, Minister of Finance. We were just uh, joking uh, upstairs that there's a secret international union of people who've had the job of Minister of Finance, and we all like and respect each other. Um, you know, it's also a job that makes, at least in my case, I had black hair, and now I have white hair. You came out looking youthful and, and well, so, you know, congratulations, Michael, for... And, of course, he was also Minister uh, of Industry and Trade and Innovation. Uh, he was also the Minister of the Interior in Sweden and has had uh, an influential and fruitful career in Swedish public life and public affairs. Uh, and, of course, he ran the budget, which is ultimately what really matters, right? Um, but he's not going to talk about finance today. He's going to talk about that subject matter that many of us are rightly and properly and justly talking about, namely the green transition. And in particular, what he's calling the transition paradox, navigating the path to becoming the world's first fossil-free welfare state. Long title with a lot of information. First, fossil-free welfare state. Got to be Sweden, right? Um, what I think is interesting about this talk, and of course you'll get the evidence firsthand in a minute, is that students of public policy, people who spend their lives or their, their days in this building, understand that having good policy ideas is one thing. Implementing those policy ideas in a democratic setting is a bit more difficult, to say the least, and therefore we're interested in the green transition and becoming free of fossil fuels. But if we want to achieve that, we have to think hard about how it's done, how one persuades, cajoles, informs, convinces the citizenry, the political parties, parliament, uh, that in fact this is what needs to be done. And uh, Michael is going to give us, you know, the three main points so that we can all do it and do it quickly because the planet needs it. That's a bit of over, uh, uh, oversell. But, um, but uh, look, the subject could not be more important and timely. The speaker could not be more distinguished. So we're really, really pleased to have you here at the School of Public Policy. We're going to give him the floor. And um, once he's done, we will sit up there. I will take chair's privilege, ask you a couple of questions. And then, of course, we will open it up to conversation, both with our audience here and also our online audience. So, again, thank you very, very much. Delighted to have you here at the School of Public Policy, the London School of Economics. The floor is all yours. Thank you. First, I want to thank the professor for, for inviting me and letting me come here and have a dialogue with all of you. It's great to see so many of you here. Um, this is truly an important night for me because as Minister of Finance, I will talk about uh, a paradox um, um, uh, on the, the green transition because Sweden is on the path to become perhaps the first fossil-free welfare state on this planet. And we have excellent conditions for this. And I will tell you all about the good stuff, and then I will transform the discussion to, to say that the war has changed a lot. Uh, the perspectives are public, the, the priorities for, for, for people uh, right now is different uh, than just a few years ago. And how will this influence the path to a green a society? And also, with the risk that the cost of this not failing to be a leader on a global change will cost Sweden its position, uh, industry, export, wealth, uh, incomes and jobs, is all at risk if we lose out in this transition. So this I will talk about today. But before I do that, I, I will actually ask you to... to I will ask you, yeah, I will start, start. Uh, I will try to... Which one? No, it is that is it one. one. It's just that I need to do that. No. Ah, okay, I'll try again. Uh, 
Okay, this is the first fossil free welfare nation in the world. This is the, the, the kind of goal we set out from Sweden, and we have excellent uh, perspectives on achieving this. Uh, but if we want to do this, we have to have people on board. And I will start with a question to you. If you'd like to go into menti.com and use the code on your mobile cell phones, uh, you can answer one question there. How do you ex what do you think, uh, what are the missions of greenhouse gases has changed in Sweden since the 1990? This is the question. So while you, you answer that question, I can say that as, as I have some experience in policy making on this field, I was Minister for Industry, Innovation and Trade when we in Sweden actually formed our first industrial strategy to re-industrial uh, re Sweden. This ha was not a modern term then, because industry was something from the past. Now we were a service country, knowledge-based service country. And we said, no, industry is still the backbone of the Swedish economy. Uh, half of GDP of Sweden comes from exports. We are a tiny country with 10 million people, but we have global companies that export around the world. Sweden is ranked number three in innovation globally. How come a small country like this can produce this? It's thanks to innovation, innovation, innovation over time that has produced these kind of big global companies that actually uh, are very successful globally. So my question is, have you during this time when I said that I've uh, presented myself uh, with this part of my portfolio, have you now done your voting? What will be the results? The result is... Oh, okay. okay, you have a very large majority saying that Sweden has decreased by 30 or by 10% since 1990. That's a good guess. Because Sweden has decreased our CO2 emissions by over 30% since 1990. Why do I start with this? Because Sweden uh, actually has a history that is uh, impressive uh, on this. But this is the result of the Swedish population. No, sit. What? Oh, it doesn't work here. Okay. So this is the. Sorry, I will. This is the result when we ask the Swedish population what they think of the CO2 emissions of Sweden. <coughs> So I would argue that this is a problem if you want to get the population on board on a journey to a zero emission welfare state. If people don't think that we managed to do things right up to now and we still have a long way to go, why should they think that we actually can transform the Swedish society as we want to do? So this perception is very dangerous for a positive view on the future. Actually, Sweden was one of the first countries in the world that in, oh, exactly. uh, we, we introduced, this is also the growth numbers of Sweden. So actually, Sweden is one of the global examples of how you reduce CO2 emissions, but actually increase GDP over time. We were one, Finland and Sweden was the first countries in the world that actually produced a, a, a taxation on uh, carbon the first taxation on carbon globally, Sweden and Finland. I think it was 91. So it actually produced results and we managed to over time work to reduce our emissions and still be very productive in the economy. This is a good selling point because many countries and people think that the cost of doing a transition is very costly. It will affect our lives in a bad way. I think Sweden is a unique example of actually being able to do things in a different way. It's very complicated. I have to use two things, so both this one and this one. Uh, if you look at this, you, you might be very engaged in the, in the climate debate and say, is this just reflecting your production in Sweden? You don't do you import or export? Do you have this kind of effect on the rest of the world when you... But even that has 
decreased. We have numbers from 2008. So we decreased our, our emissions also in other countries, not only in Sweden. So it is possible, but the journey is still long before we get to net zero. Uh, what's happening now then? If you, you have this image and you have the population thought that it, it is not possible to do this, Sweden has unique uh, possibilities to do the transition. Uh, I usually say 100% fossil free electricity production. Uh, it's almost 100%. I think it's 98%. But actually, look at, I see the debate in, in Great Britain. I saw Labour challenging the government saying that by the year 2030, we should have a fossil free electricity system. Sweden has already a fossil free. With the biggest exporter of electricity in the European Union 2022. We had the lowest electricity prices in the European Union in 2022, although we had the war. So it created higher prices in Sweden than we are used to. So we, have, we lost the election on it <laughs> uh, and the diesel prices. Uh, I think these kind of cost of living uh, perspective actually cost us our government uh, the votes in the last election in 2022. But we have a fossil free electricity production. We have roadmaps, uh, roadmaps with industries. In 22 industry segments of Sweden, industry has sat down, thought of how do we get to zero emissions. And they have their, uh, in, um, uh, they have their plans of doing investment, technological shifts, what they need from government. So government is working together with industries with 22 roadmaps to get to zero emissions. And industries in Sweden are seeing this, this as an advantage. They see that this is the way that they want to compete on global market. Because if you want to be an innovation leader, you have to be in the forefront of development. What you see on the image there is the first fossil free dumper truck in the world. It's made of steel without any fossil free, without, without any CO2 emissions at all. So the steel, you know, the steel process has been the same for a thousand years. You produce steel by having iron ore and using coal and make steel. Now we actually in Sweden produce steel without CO2 emissions at all, using hydrogen, uh, hydrogen and then getting only water as a rest product. It, it requires enormous amounts of electricity, but it is possible to do it. We actually do it industrial scale today in Sweden. And think of it, you know Sweden, you know the, the Volvo cars, the, the Saab trucks or the Volvo buses of the world, we're a transporting country. We, we like to transport things and produce. You, it's not a big thing to produce an electric car with steel that is produced by coal. That's not the selling point. So if you want to produce an electric car in the future, you would like to have fossil free steel. You wouldn't like to have batteries fueled by coal or oil. You would like the batteries to be fueled by fossil free energy. So this position is kind of unique in the world. And we want to push this even further. And you see the market for this is already there. So when we now in Sweden build the biggest mega battery factory in Europe, in Skellefteå, from scratch, we're not a country of battery production, we build the biggest battery factory because they know that we would like the most sustainable batteries on the planet. Because if you want to have an electric car, you would like to have a green battery. And you would like to have green steel. So this transformation is now happening in Swedish industry. Remarkable investments, especially in rural parts of Sweden, where we 20 years ago had people leaving the northern part of Sweden, getting paid to travel to Stockholm to take a job. They even pour down, tear down uh, housing, housings in the northern part of Sweden because people were not living there anymore. Now we actually think of how do we get 50,000 people to work in the industry with well-paid job in northern part of Sweden. This is happening now. This is really a turnover. So this would be, as you hear, a great selling point for any politician. 
Uh, any country would be proud if your companies could produce fossil free steel or green batteries or green chemistry or using 70% of Sweden is forests. We could use forests to produce everything that is made of oil. We can use by forest products. So we can transform every part of society into sustainable uh, process. This is our goal, to be a fossil-free welfare nation. And we see the investments, we see the job creation. So what's the problem? The cost of living. The war happened. And people got afraid. We saw the energy prices rise. We had the highest diesel prices in the world when people were fueling their car in Sweden because we have used bio energy in the tank to reduce the emissions from the transportation sector. Good environmental politics, but still it came with a cost for consumers. So this has changed the, the, the kind of di the, 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 the discussion in Sweden, because up to then, before the war, seven out of eight parties in Parliament in Sweden were all agreeing that we should be a leader in the green transition. Then happened the war and populism hit also Sweden. And that's not so strange because people in Sweden have lost 10 years of real wage increase for a very short period of time. Ordinary people seeing their wages not being sufficient for paying their bills, especially young families with with loans on their housing, seeing that interest rates have really cut their budgets uh, with thousand every month. This has created a new environment. We see the fuel and energy prices spike with the, with the war, and we see an increased polarization of climate policy. Trump was first, leaving the Paris Agreement. Now I see right-wing and right-wing extreme parties around the world making climate the new culture debate after migration. That's kind of interesting. But I would argue this is very dangerous because if you look at the other side, how do, how do a country, a small country like Sweden, want to compete on a global market in five or ten years time? What are our, our advantages? What should we be our selling point? I would argue that it is this. And the, in, the, the image of people is that it's very costly to do the transition. And it is costly. To produce steel without coal, it's 25, today it's 25% uh, more expensive than usual. To producing cement, it's 70% more expensive. If you could use, you could use the same kind of technique with cement uh, to actually reduce all the emissions from, from producing cement. A lot of electricity there as well. But look at the cost. Oh, you don't see it. 0.5 percent. What is the extra cost for a car? If you would like to buy a Volvo car, what, and it's fossil free, made of fossil free steel, the extra cost of that is 250 pounds. Of a car that costs 50,000 pounds. It's not that thing that will, dif dif that will not It'd be the thing that prohibits you from buying a modern Volvo car because it's much more expensive than the fossil free steel. But if you want to buy an electric car from Volvo, you perhaps would like to have a green Volvo car, not a brown Volvo car. So actually, Volvo is stopping producing fossil engines. Or they will only produce engines and cars from next year that are electrical globally. Because they know if they don't compete with Chinese on electric cars, they will be put out of the market. So this is a survival issue for the Swedish company that actually to do the transition. So this, you have cost, yes, but the cost for the consumer is very slim. But for the producer, this cost is not that costly because you can take the premium price. If you sell the car that is actually fossil free altogether, you can have a higher price than another one. You should be able to, to be the premium uh, competition. I think if you would like to succeed, that I didn't do as Minister of Finance because I lost elections, 
If you have such a good story to be the first fossil free welfare nation of the world, you have an industry on the move, wanting to do the investments, are actually creating thousands of new jobs in your country, and you have seven out of eight parties saying we want to go in this direction, and you actually lose the election, you have to do something wrong. You didn't look at how to do the transition just. What can we actually do to make people want to do the change? You have to have incentives for people to make the right decision. It cannot only be on an individual uh, base. I don't think the green transition will happen if people should just act as consumers. I think we should act as a society to do this transition because then you can split the cost and you can always incentivize the right decisions. So it is possible to do incentives of energy saving so that people actually can lower their bill on energy and actually produce a better energy system. It is possible to incentivize people on the countryside that needs their car more than the cities to actually have extra money in the pockets so they can keep their car on the countryside. But in Stockholm, where you can take the, the, the train or the bus or the subway, you shouldn't have that kind of incentives because you can do it in a different way. You could work with these kind of incentives to actually get public support for the green transition. So I would argue that this has been underestimated as a force. And I think Europe stands to have the same debate with Fit for 55. It's theoretically very good. I like it. It's a green, big package for competitiveness for Europe in the future. But when the Poles, the Germans, the French should pay their higher energy bills, should pay more for driving your car, this will create political tensions. So if you don't look up, if you're not aware of this, you might lose out on a very important uh, way of going forward. And I would say that Sweden stands to gain by being the first fossil free welfare nation in the world. As Minister for Finance, I would argue this is, my, it is perhaps the most important investment that we can do to create jobs, to create the next generation export, to get the investments in Sweden, not in the US, not in other parts of the world, but actually here in Europe. We have to compete on this transition and we have excellent possibility in doing so. But then we have to learn our lesson. We have to understand that people need to be on board on the transition. If we do it, we have an excellent future in front of us. Thank you very much. so much. That was uh, informative, it was clear, and of course it could not be more relevant. Let me begin with a tiny little question. So if 99% of electricity is uh, generated by non-fossile means, is it nuclear, is it water, is it sun, is it wind, what is it? We have hydropower, so water, uh, we have nuclear, uh, and we have bio. Uh, because we have 70% of woods in right. Sweden, so, right. and then we have wind increasing quite rapidly. Uh -huh. uh, but if we would like to succeed in this, this transformation, we would need to approximately double the electricity production in Sweden mm -hmm. in a couple of decades. Because, because producing that kind of steel requires a lot of electricity. Right. Yeah, a lot of less energy uh -huh. than today because right. uh, you use a lot of coal. Right. So actually it's more energy efficient to use electricity, uh -huh. but you need so much more electricity to do the transition. In all these sectors, it's ele electricity. And nuclear is not uh, politically controversial as it is in Germany, say? It's you always controversial. Everything about uh, nuclear is always con uh, uh, controversial, but it's not controversial to have nuclear power in Sweden. Okay. It's a uh, kind of a non-issue. So you're, and not, now, you're not going the Merkel route of closing and then changing your mind? No. All right. No, but it, it, it was one of the political debates uh, before the election was actually that 
we got, um, they said that we politically shut down nuclear power in Sweden. Right. We didn't do it, but it was so low prices in Sweden, so it was not profitable to do reinvestment after Fukushima in, in old nuclear right. power plants, so they shut down the old power plants and they blamed us for, 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 for not having them around. So it was one of the issues that was in the election campaign, but now uh, several of the political parties are open for new nuclear powers in Sweden. Mm -hmm. If it's economically sound, and that's not mm -hmm. easy to answer because the prices of solar, the wind are going yeah, down all the time. Yeah. So it's very hard to actually do the math yeah. to see how, how actually nuclear power should compete on that. Yeah. Although it is true that wind and solar need to be stored somewhere, yeah. because you cannot generate it when it's not windy or when it's not sunny. So there is the issue of storage. Some people are making the claim that you need nuclear as a backup even if you have lots of wind. Yeah, yeah. yeah and we have it, but yeah. we have also yeah. hydrogen. And that fulfills the kind of same argument. But, because but, you, but, but you need to generate the hydrogen with something, I mean, make it, you know. Yeah, but if you have also water, if you have water um, in, in rivers and right. you, you, you stop producing, right. you can stop producing when the wind is, uh, when right. it's very windy, you don't produce. I and see. when it's less windy, you produce a so lot you, of water. So, and, you, so and you use the hydro as, 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 as a backup. That, that's today, but right. tomorrow you could yeah. also use uh, even more nuclear, of course. Uh, so, so you have to have that, but you should also generate uh, hydro, uh, hy hydropower, that goes. Yeah, hydropower, uh, yeah. You should also use, you should produce hydropower from windmills, for instance, yeah. when the prices are low. Sure. sure. So that was my first question designed to display my ignorance. Let me ask a second ignorant question. You pointed out that Sweden has had carbon taxation for a very long time. Many countries have tried and failed. What was the recipe, politically speaking, for getting that done early on? I think in the beginning it was so small, so no one noticed it, okay. for real. Uh, uh, taxation uh, by stealth. Yeah, but uh, yeah. And then you got used to it, and uh, okay. no one really complained okay. about it. Uh, and, and we've actually managed to use the historical crisis on energy every right. time to do good things. So when we had the oil crisis, we, had, we have almost none of the residential um, uh, heating systems in Sweden are based by oil, because after the oil crisis, we, we transformed the system into district heating, okay. uh, and also... Um, uh, I'm sorry, and district heating is, is what exactly? It is both for uh, the rest products are forests, but okay. it might be also uh, waste. Okay. So we actually gather waste and burn it. But you, and don't, that's you, very don't, you don't burn the waste in every building. You burn the waste in some centralized place and yes. you pump something. Yes, you and pump, we create. Pump, no, heat. we create heat uh, okay. and then reduce the heat. And it's very, okay. it's very smart. Uh, and the other thing is now we have bio CCS. You know, store uh, capture and storage. Sure, sure, uh, see, sure. if you put that. Uh, on these facilities, yeah. you can create negative uh, CO2 emissions. If you produce, if you do this production from forest products today, you can get negative emissions, mm -hmm. and that market will explode. I would say because some countries will not be able to reduce their emissions; they want to buy uh, negative emissions down, and we can do it from from the Swedish forests. But let me stick with the politics. So, I'm going to. These are my words, not yours, so we won't quote you. You, you used um, what some political economists called the frog in lukewarm water strategy. Put a frog in a pot, water is not really hot, it just goes up bit by bit by bit. You end up eating the frog, but the frog never quite noticed it. That's one, was that the key to getting carbon taxation into the picture? Am I being unfair here? No, and we have some, some system that... He didn't say that, yeah. I did, so yeah, please but, don't quote him. No, but um, I would argue if you make a big chunk of increased taxation on something, you create a big political debate. Right, right. Uh, uh, yeah. But it's easier to do it when, when the economy is bad, as it was in the beginning of, of the 90s. We had to kind of sort out our public finances, uh -huh. so we had to raise taxes. So this was part of a, a overall discussion. We have to get our public finance in order. This taxation it was new, okay. so it was introduced in the beginning of the 90s. Uh, and some of the taxation in, is indexed right. every year. 
So it increases a bit if you don't take decisions, so it will increase over time. So if people are getting more money, they don't really see it. But if they're losing out, as we're losing out right now, with real wage decrease, people notice that the taxation is going up. But I imagine even if it began small, to have the effect of this massive transition, by now it has to be sufficiently high to induce people to invest in greenery as opposed to investment in, investing in brown things. So by now the price effect must be substantial. Yes, but most industries has already transformed because uh, it has been the steel industry with the right, coal, for instance, right. the cement has their problems as well. Right, but right. all other big industries have, have tried to move away from these right. kind of costs because right. they, they, they have gained from, from doing the transition. Also, ordinary houses are, are heated by district heating mm -hmm. or, or, or heat pumps. Uh, no one is heated by, by coal or oil in Sweden, uh, and that's kind of good for your personal economy today as well. So, so when that transition, and this is a big issue in the UK, yeah. today most homes in the UK are, are, are heated by oil or gas, and the refitting of you know, everybody's house is, you know, the, the, the bill is gigantic. When this happened in Sweden 25 years ago, who paid that bill? We have, uh, we have had all different kind of supports. If you make that kind of investment, you get a tax reduction or you, you get a, a, a small amount uh, to, to reduce the cost of doing so, the so, change. So it's government money, but done gradually, yeah. so that the government budget didn't take one big hit one no, year. Exactly. Uh, and the other thing is, if you split the cost up for 10 years, you actually see that you gain quite fast, as if you mm -hmm. put up solar panels you get the money back in, in seven years. Right, right. If people actually understand that, more people would like to do the investments, of mm -hmm. course. Mm -hmm. So let me take you to the, to the more recent politics now. Um, two things happened across the world, including Sweden. One is that there was a shock to consumer price indices above and beyond energy. Energy may have been the main driver, or one main driver, there's a big debate about that. So, inflation is always the thing that makes voters dislike whoever happens to be in power. When I was 25 years old, my first job in the Chilean Treasury was to do a, a little picture that showed the monthly inflation rate and the president's approval rating. And my boss, the finance minister, would take that to the president of Chile every month. And he would say, see, Mr. President, we have more inflation. Your popularity has gone down. We have to tighten fiscal policy. And it worked. Um, so, you know, uh, people never like inflation. In addition to that, there was a big shock to the price of energy for obvious reasons, the most important one of which was Putin's, you know, brutal and nasty aggression against, against Ukraine. I can see how by subsidizing the consumption of energy, you might have or one might have eased the adjustment to the price of energy shock. Even that is hard to do. I mean, Germany tried it, you know, the UK tried it. You know, the budget cost is gigantic and people still get fairly upset. What I don't quite see, you know, you, you seem to suggest that there was a way kind of out, so let me, let, me, let me try to pin you down here and get you to tell us a bit more about exactly what the way out is. You know, if, say, in most European countries or in the U.S., at the peak inflation was about 10 percent and wages were still rising at, you know, the historical rate of, say, 2 percent, well, you know, that's minus 8 in one year. That's sort of macro adjustment, right? So no treasury could possibly subsidize the wage bill of a country to the tune of 8%. That bankrupts the treasury forever. So what exactly is it that Sweden might have done that didn't do, or the UK might have done that didn't do, to make sure that we don't have this backlash, or at least reduce the possibility or the probability that we have such a big backlash against climate policy? Give us the two or three things. If, if we made you emperor of Europe for 24 hours, uh, what are the two or three things you'd have the EU redo if we could not only make you the emperor, but rewind the movie and go back to two years ago? Okay. If I look at it from a strictly Swedish perspective, mm -hmm. as a politician in Sweden wanting to defend Sweden, right. I would argue that the, 
we produce the most electricity in Europe, we export it most. Right. We got the German energy prices into Sweden right. because Germany has not their electricity regions as we have. Right. If they would have a different pricing system as they should have, yes. we wouldn't have got these uh, prices in Sweden at all. Yeah. So what we produced was huge profits in an energy sector in Sweden. Right. These profits should be brought back to the Swedish consumers in some ways. Okay. Uh, the Swedish government didn't succeed in that because so that, they, that... they didn't they didn't produce any they didn't have any more cost of producing the electricity. They just imported the German prices and got profits. So you uh, of course the Swedish population was a bit pissed. So that means a windfall profit on power yeah, companies? They, they should have they should have done that. And we had a way of doing it. Uh, re redistributing some of the, the, the costs to, to consumers and companies in Sweden. But it took so long, so we actually had the, 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 the inflation process into right. the system. So actually, right. Sweden, although we had the lowest energy prices, we had a bigger increase in inflation in Sweden than most European countries. That's kind of crazy. And we have also central embargoing wage system in Sweden, yeah. Yeah. which is very low, right. so it was not the wages. So we actually had a worsening situation than many other countries, although we didn't have to have the same situation. So you, you think that the inflation spike could have been maybe not avoided, yeah. but eased somewhat? A, a bit eased. And then you should support uh, and, and households that are very uh, hardly affected. But, but let's take that one at a time. So you ease the spike in prices by doing what? By keeping power prices low? How could you possibly not import the German electricity price if it's an integrated market? Yeah. So, but if, if they would... Sorry, I'm being the more yeah. economist but, here, but you yeah, know... But I, I, I understand. If you would yeah. have a perfect market, you should have the same prices everywhere. We Precisely. don't have that in right. Europe. We have uh, energy sure. regions. Yeah, sure, sure, and sure. Germany should have an energy region in the north. I see, I see. Then it I would see. be more similar yeah. to Sweden because we I have see. energy regions in Sweden. So it, yeah. it's and unfair that the Germans Ger don't Germany have Germany also made rules. one other big mistake, which is they didn't have LNG capacity. Yeah. So when Putin cut them off, it took them a while to bring you know, the production cost down. Perhaps it was not the problem of LNG. It was the problem of being dependent on Russia, on gas. Huge mistake. Huge mistake. Humongous mistake, yes. right? Yes, yes. You don't have to be an industrial country to do to do that, yes. as Sweden has yeah. proved. I mean, lesson number one of the last 10 years, never stake the life of your economy uh, and put it in the hands of a dictator. Not a good idea. That's uh, what we're yeah. doing when it comes to oil and diesel around the world. <clears throat> Actually, uh, that's uh, uh, provoking thoughts. Yeah. And now Russia has decided yeah. with OPEC that they would raise uh, the prices globally because yeah. they want to do it. Should we also do the transition in, in this part of the energy sector? I think so. Okay, so let me play devil's advocate for a couple more questions and then we'll open it up. You were saying we need to support households, and that's probably true. At the same time, writing checks for households is a more expansionary fiscal policy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in some sense, that makes with demand stronger, that makes the inflation spike larger. So. It's not quite clear that we have enough instruments to solve all problems, right? No, but if you have an external shock or if you, you have a, a central bank that raises interest rates yeah. quite high, right. you should always look at very vulnerable households. Yeah. If you don't do that, right. the government yeah. is so, uh, so, pushing them in front of the bus. So obviously. you're arguing that we need a subsidy, but not, not for everybody, only for low-income households? Yeah. For instance, our okay. energy right. subsidies that came out afterwards okay. uh, uh, they didn't have any roof for how much mm -hmm. money you got paid as right. a household. Right. So we had a right. couple of households in Sweden that got 70,000 70, pounds back for their energy consumption. Right. And we have households with children that almost cannot food feed their children. This is not the smart thing to do. Yeah. And the Riksbank tightened quite, quite a bit, right? They tightened quite a lot, but on the other side, the, the Riksbank of Sweden, the Central Bank of Sweden, was very aggressive before that right, with sure, very sure, low right, negative sure, interest sure, rates. Of course, of so course. they created kind of perhaps a problem that was yeah. even worse afterwards. So, but they, they were quite pushing it up. And in Sweden, people, families don't have long loans. 
they have very short loans. Right. Uh, like, like, like the UK. Like the UK yeah. and Norway. Right. Norway. I think 90% right. yeah. of the loans yeah. are short term. So, in, in, so, including mortgages. For, for, yes. Yeah, yeah. So when the central bank increases interest rate, it's yeah. directly affecting all the families in Sweden. For those of you thinking of getting jobs in central banks, the Rich Bank of Sweden is one of the best central banks in the world. You can, you know, he can give you advice on how to apply there later. <laughs> uh, um, really very good, very competent, very professional central bank. The oldest. The oldest, exactly, in the world. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. So I've had lots of pesky economist questions from my end. I'm sure you will have deeper questions from your end. Actually, no, one, one, one last question from me. Not, not, pesky, not pesky economics, but just 30 seconds on geopolitics. Um, you said, and I agree, that um, it's hard to think of a worse policy than, you know, complete dependence on fossil fuels from one particular large country to the east. Given that lesson, given the war, given the backlash in some countries now against the war, I'm thinking of Slovakia or, or, or Poland more recently, how do you see that playing out in the European Union? I think Europe has been remarkable united on this front yes. because they see Russia as a, a very nasty neighbor, a nasty neighbor right now and will continue to, to be very dangerous for Europe. So I would expect Europe to stick together still, but I think eventually over time uh, more and more forces will be reluctant to do the same support as we've done so mm -hmm. far. But I think uh, the, the green transition is also a security issue right. for Europe. Sure. If we sure. do not transform, we will continue yeah. to be reliant on, on Russian assets. And I think that is really crazy. Yeah. So, so hopefully, it, um, and Europe still is on a global level, still a front runner when it comes to the green transition. Sure. In some fields, uh, China is running very fast. Now with the US uh, Inflation Reduction Act, they are doing heavily investment. Yeah. So if Europe would like to stay in front, they have to continue this. Otherwise, they will lose out on this as well, as they lose out on AI, as they lose out on different technologies that are Europe are not competing with the Chinese and, 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 and the US. And one political question, and I promise I will open up the floor. <laughs> Sweden is a country with a long history of shall we say, distrust of military alliances. Nonetheless, you took the bold, the bold decision of joining NATO. Tell us a bit about the domestic politics of that. You know, perhaps Sweden has been a non-aligned country for 200 years. Um, we have not been to war during this time. So, of course, this was a very dramatic decision for Sweden to take, to actually decide that we would like to join a, a military alliance. Uh, but it's... It, it's in the light of the Russian uh, uh, invasion of Ukraine, because if, you, if they can full-time go in and invade uh, another country in Europe, uh, our security situation is different than, than before. So we, we agreed that we should join uh, NATO, and we should join together with Finland, uh, our close neighbor, and, uh, uh, and also a country that has been non-aligned for, for quite some time. Uh, now Finland is member and Sweden is not because uh, Turkey is blocking our membership and that's very irritating. Uh, not only for us uh, because now we have NATO uh, countries all around us so in some sense we have the security that way but for NATO, for Bo the Baltic countries, for Finland mm -hmm. not having Sweden as a member of NATO creates huge problems with their planning of also defense strategies going forward. So, but politically, this is not a big issue because uh, there is a big consensus. Uh, two political parties, the left, the former Communist Party, and the, the Green Party is a bit hesitating, uh, but uh, not that blunt in saying no. So there's kind of, um, everyone sees that this is something that has to happen. An entry into NATO requires parliamentary ratification? Yes. So, so it will be a vote in parliament. Yes. And the votes are there once yes. Mr. Erdogan stops um, dragging yes. his feet, shall we say. Yes. All right. And Hungary. And Hungary, yes. Yes. One, one autocrat, one quasi-autocrat. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, this is fun. I could go on forever, but I'm going to be uh, sharing the privilege of a conversation with Michael with the audience. Yes, sir. Right there. Uh, well, there's a microphone over there.
And if you can say, um, sort of tell, tell the room who you are and keep the questions re reasonably short, that would be absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much for your presentation. It was uh, very interesting. My name is Joseba. I'm from Spain and I'm a student at the European Institute in the Sea Political Economy of Europe. So I have uh, two questions, if I might. Uh, first one is to what extent uh, is the green transition in Sweden uh, and your work was related um, to uh, scientists? Because uh, I always or many times get the impression that climate change and the green transition is being too political and too little scientific. Uh, we have like, main examples. One of them, for example, in California, they try to implement electric cars but then they didn't have enough energy uh, produced in order to have enough electric cars being uh, replaced by fuel cars. And then a uh, second question. I was thinking about um, in order not to depend that much on gas and on oil on other countries, as also Professor Andres Velasco uh, said, we buy European countries tend to buy a lot of gas and oil from um, countries, for example, the US, that produces oil and gas through fracking. And to, to what extent would it be, to, or does it make sense to not implement these policies in Europe and let them be implemented and also profiting for, uh, from them in other countries so that they are like in danger, but we are not, we are safe, we are green, but we uh, buy energy from countries that are not green. So thank you very much. Okay, first, the second question, I, I think that's a moral problem. If countries say that they want to do a transition but they buy LNG, uh, they still buy fossil fuels. So I think the transition has to be for real. So you have to build an energy system that is actually renewable in the long term. And it might be also nuclear power because I put that in the fossil free uh, category. So, but. For Sweden, it's not about transition of the current system. It's just to have more electricity, so to continue to do what we already do in Sweden. I think uh, today, for us, it is wind power. If we have 70% of Sweden was forest, I, I mentioned that. So if you, if the most cheapest energy is wind power on land. Yeah. That's really cheap. So if you can combine the interests of forest and the interests of wind power, uh, with municipality interest, local interest, you get a very uh, cheap energy. And then we have a very long coastal line. So if you have wind powers out at sea, that creates a lot of energy as well. So that's 10 to 15 years ahead, that's the majority of energy that we, we, should, we should put into the system. Then in, in, the, in, the, in a longer perspective, it might be new nuclear power or whatever, if this new or small new modular, uh, if that works and if it's profitable. Science, both. Uh, these techno tech technologies are not new. Actually, so it was not scientific breakthrough that led to these kind of investments. It was the mo uh, sites that actually proved that the technology actually worked in production. That was, and that, that is a, a, an interest of the government, for instance, to, do techno to help share risk when technology shifts. I think that's a, 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 a role for the public to play. But, so it was not a scientific-led uh, uh, journey. It was an industry-led journey together with politics, setting ambitious goals and industry wanting to lead the transition. And then you get the investments, and the investments create a new perspective on, on the question, because when people see this is jobs on the, on the line, investments in our part of the country on the line, that creates a positive momentum on the green transition, not only the, the cost side. Importing LNG for the Germans was a reasonable thing to do. They, yes, they must. I mean, I yeah. mean you know, yeah. once they got cut off, they had no other choice. No, right? of course. I mean, in the long run, you don't want to do that, but in the short run, there was of no course. way out. In the back there. Hi. My question, firstly, is about how this green transition is fossil fuel free. In India and also in Africa, um, well, just backtrack a bit. Everyone's talking about scope one and two. 
scope three, 90% of scope three is in the global south. And in the global south, if we're not burning fossil fuels, you're not getting one ounce of any of the materials that you require to make your wind turbines, solar and electric cars across the whole supply chain. And then to support this question, first question, is everyone's talking about Russia and China and Canada. The biggest player in the room now for the next 50 years is neither of those countries. It's the biggest continent in the world, and that's Africa. Africa, Africa, Africa. And in the center is Central and Western Africa. I, those countries that no one probably knows in this room, what's happening in a small country in West Africa called Niger. And when Niger is saying to the French, we are not going to sell our uranium to you at slave prices, as we've been giving to you for 50 years. We want a fair market price, and we are not going to sell you the materials. We're going to make the materials into products. The question here is, we in the West have been very, very privileged getting these cheap materials at slave labor prices by imposing these conditions on Africa. Now Africa is turning around and saying, no more. We're not going to take this crap anymore. We want not only a fair price, but Europe, US has a big problem. We are now going to control the resources which we are mining by producing and actually extracting tons of fossil fuels. So in the same way the renewables industry has been taking fossil fuels show us transparency, I've been asking the renewables industry, when will the renewables industry show transparency that there is no aspect of renewables that is fossil fuel free and it's not also talking about the fact that in Africa and India we are strip mining our forests and our land to give you every single gram of all the minerals you require for this renewables. So how is there any tinge of green in these solutions? And when Africa wakes up, it's a huge problem for the rest of us. Thank you. Good question, because everyone talks about perhaps the green transition without talking about metals and minerals, because metal and minerals are relevant to almost all these technologies. So speaking of batteries, wind power, solar energy, although there are also technological breakthroughs in new materials. But still, uh, do you know that Sweden produces 90% of the iron ore in Europe? We're a, a big mining country. 90% of the iron is in Europe is produced in Sweden. And we actually, one of the green transition that is very complicated but big is to actually also make the, the, the iron production fossil free in Sweden. So it is possible to do even iron fossil free, uh, but it, uh, the mining industry. <coughs> but I would argue that we should make smart investments also together with other African countries because today the the, the energy cost of fossil, fossil uh, renewable energy is lower than actually fossil energy today on the global market. Um, yeah, it's right. Yeah, but if you do new investments, which is necessary in these mines or in this industry, you should do it with renewable energy because it's cheaper than the old energy. So we have to make the financial gap there because I think in these countries, the investments they are doing today in 20 years ahead will be determined if we can, you, can we make this. And they don't, they don't lose out in, in actually using uh, uh, different kind of uh, technologies to actually produce uh, energy not using coal, for instance. That is something that we have an interest in helping them finance. So I'm on your side on this. I think it does not need help. They just need the West to leave. Yeah. Uh, it's a job in help. No. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I, my argument, they will sell to those who pay the most, I would say. And perhaps we should pay the most or the Chinese pay the most. I don't know who will pay the most. But they will, put a, they will sit on a golden mine that actually would produce a lot of in, yeah, yeah. incomes. I would say that. But they should make the investments in uh, renewable energy because yeah. otherwise we'll have problems globally. Let's let, let stick to this point for a minute because it's a really crucial one. Way too many developing countries, not only in Africa, get told today by the World Bank saying that their first 
and foremost priority must be to reduce emissions. And, you know, surprise, surprise, Niger probably, I don't know, I don't know the number, but I'm going to make it up, and I'm probably not too far away. A country like Niger probably accounts for not point, not, not, not 1% of total global emissions. So for a small developing country in Africa, or for that matter in South America, which is the other place where there are lots of these rare minerals on Earth, the biggest contribution they can make to the green transition worldwide, after all, what matters is overall emissions, right, is not so much to curtail domestic emissions, which are tiny to begin with, but to make as much of that stuff that the world will need, say lithium, uh, and of course to be paid reasonable prices for it. And so a big question is ideological. These countries maybe need to be freed from the impositions from a place like the World Bank that is giving them the wrong instructions. But secondly, are we, are we comfortable that these markets are sufficiently competitive so the guys who have the rare earths, so the guys who have the lithiums, will be, you know, if demand is going up, supply is restricted, the price will be going up, right? So are, are these markets working well? I, I would think they are, but I don't know enough to really be sure. My point is that I think the World Bank, actually, when we look at new investments yeah. in energy in these countries, why should they invest in fossil energy if they can invest in cheaper fossil-free energy system? No, no, How is that helping anyone? No. I don't see the point. No, that, that is without question. However, if you only have $100 million to invest, uh, is the investment purely from the point of view of the welfare of planet Earth? Is the investment preferable in quick extraction of, say, lithium so that the world can have more EVs, or is, is it preferable to have clean electricity generation in that country to the detriment of the production of lithium? If you have to choose between the two because your investment budget is only X and nobody will lend you more money because you're a developing country, then you should certainly be doing, I think, the lithium and not the green generation. Now, that, of course, moves you to a different question, which I'm happy to ask you about. Sorry, I'm going to ask. Um, developed countries promised developing countries 100 billion two cops ago. Two cops ago. Of the 100 billion, not even half has been dispersed. If you look at the real money needed for the green transition in developing countries, we're talking about trillions. And that money is nowhere. Um, and I can say this with some degree of confidence because I was part of the G20, I'm embarrassed to say this, eminent persons group that had to advise the G20 on this, and I was more recently in a panel advising the World Bank and the IMF on this. Truth is, there have been reports and commissions, and the commissions have taken in the reports and have issued more reports, which then have gone to committees, whatever. The real money for Niger to do these investments is nowhere to be found. I mean, you know, it's... It's peanuts compared to what we really need. And, of course, Sweden is very generous. It's the country in the world which, as a share of GDP, probably provides the most aid in the world. But the big countries, including this one, are not putting their money where the mouth is. And without that kind of massive resource mobilization, these kinds of investments you're advocating simply are not going to happen. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Uh, I think it's a fair statement because the Western country has... Uh, failed Africa and yeah. some other countries in the world that actually they we promised and we haven't delivered. Yeah. On the other hand, this amount I mean, if, of if money. If anybody has is, delivered, that is probably Sweden. It's just, the rest of us haven't delivered. Yeah, yeah. But, but but still, still yes. Yeah. But still, it doesn't yeah. help. Uh, yeah. uh, but on the other hand, I, I would argue we shouldn't only we shouldn't only look at that. This. This amount is still too, too little, as you yeah, mentioned. Yeah. So how do we actually transform private investments Precisely. into uh, a, an agreement with that, that's these big, assets? That's because that, look, uh, look, a totally different environment. We see in Sweden now, because yeah. we're a well-organized country, we have strong industries to begin with, we have institutions. Yeah. Right. Now, a, a person that actually worked with Tesla right. can come to Sweden and say, I want, a big, I want to build the biggest battery factory in Europe in Geleftio. Mm -hmm. I have no money. Right. Can I get the money okay. and I will build the biggest factory? Mm -hmm. And he 
transforms it in five years' time. I'm, I'm, uh, so it I'm, happened here because right. private company want, so, saw the business model, there was institution, right. there was kind of a bit collaboration with the government, but not much money, right. but it happened. But in these right. countries, it's much more harder. It's yeah, so exactly. much harder yeah. to get the institution right, to get the investment plan going. Right. Right. And that's the biggest problem we have, because right. it's not only giving money to, to right. poor countries, it's getting the institutions going right. in the right direction. So in, in the jargon of international co cooperation, that's the de-risking of private investment. Yeah. Contrary to the question in the back, I don't think the West needs to leave. I think the question needs to, the West needs to actually pony up money. Yeah. Uh, uh, but the problem is that private money can only be induced, cannot be coerced. And as you point out, private money is not going, no. and public money is too little. That is the core of the issue, yeah. and that's something that we don't talk about enough. In any case, I'm talking about way too much right here in the middle. Yes, in the blue shirt. Yes, you, please. Thank you. Uh, your microphone is coming away. There. Um, hello, my name is Karolina Lagerkrans, and I'm also from Sweden, ah. as you might be able to tell by my accent. Uh -huh. um, so I actually have two questions for you. So the first one has to do with kind of this image of Sweden as a leading country when it comes to the green transition. And I personally, I, I am worried that this is dangerous, both uh, domestically but also internationally, because if we look at the new government, Sweden is not leading at all. Um, this new government is actually rolling back a lot of the policies that your government put in place. Um, and the, the scary thing is also if you look at who voted for this government, it was my generation. It was not the older generation, it was the young people that voted for the more conservative governments. And part of the rhetoric of the right-wing coalition was that Sweden is already doing enough. Sweden is a leading country, we can actually lower our ambition. I don't think this is true. The second thing is, could you speak a little bit about the feasibility of what you're actually presenting? Because um, based on the information that I've been able to find, if you look at all these fossil-free steel factories up north, currently we don't have the green electricity that we need there. And how will we actually get it? Now, obviously, there is talk about uh, nuclear energy and building small module reactors up north. The truth is, if you look at, yeah, that is not supported by regional politicians. Um, and wind power also faces a lot of pushback by uh, local communities in Sweden. So I just wanted to be a little bit critical of this narrative of Sweden as a leading country because I think we have a long way to go. Thank you. And you thought that was going to be an easy question. Uh, <laughs> no, but it's a very interesting question because I think many people around the world think that we have a Greta generation in Sweden, the Greta Thunberg, uh, uh, that led the climate debate on young people. And we had a huge uh, setback on young voters, not women, but young men. Uh, so it's a very clear division between men and women when it comes to these questions. Uh, so it's not only a generational issue, it's a, a gender issue. Uh, and I think uh, when we look at the numbers, we see that it, it was much more here and now. Uh, the most common question I got on a, on a school when I traveled the election campaign, the first question I got, how much cheaper do, do you think petrol can get after the election? Right. The first question. In, uh, in the Greta generation. <laughs> That's kind of strange. Uh, but it says something about the, also perhaps the image that they created on this issue, but also a cost of, there's also a cost of living crisis here, but not as much as I, I think you mentioned. So yes, uh, we see that and that's a problem, but I think also that people need to know at, that it is possible. People don't think it's possible, then they can say, let the Chinese do it or whatever. We, it doesn't matter what Sweden does. And they don't perhaps always see that there is something to gain from this. And there is a positive side to these investments. Uh, and we, we've lost out on that argument as well, I think. But on the other hand, it's huge. If we would do all these investments, it's doubling the electricity production in Sweden. We had the same electricity production for 30 years in Sweden, so it's huge to double it. You understand? So it is a challenge, but when we look at the but possible new uh, electricity for the next 10 to 15 years, it's mainly wind power. On land, 
and then the municipality has to get something back. If a municipality agrees on having a big wind mall here, they should get some money. Because <laughs> otherwise, why should they say yes? And we don't have that system today. That's crazy. Uh, the other thing is we actually make it more expensive to build wind powers at sea, far out. We make it, the new government makes it more expensive to actually connect to wind. It's crazy, but it's still, it's not the government, I think. I, I'm kind to the government now. Uh -huh. I think the government wants to have wind power in Sweden, but I think the biggest party in the coalition is the Swedish Democrats that actually make this a cultural war. They've said they don't, they don't like wind power. They would like to tear down wind power. And they don't like the green steel for some reason. Uh, so uh, this is the biggest party in the coalition. So it influences the government as well. So, but still, I think that the, 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 the private companies are set to, to lead. So I think they will still do investments. But I think we will lose out on the investment. I think there will be more investments in Finland. It will be more investments in Canada. It will be more investments in the US because Sweden are losing out on pace going forward. Michael, allow me to stay with politics for 30 seconds. You said that you were campaigning and young men, you emphasize this point, were asking you about the price of petrol. As you said that, I was remembered of uh, a man called uh, Emmanuel Macron, who tried to tax diesel. And um, I remember a very memorable uh, line by the head of the Gilets Jaunes who said, the president is worried about the end of the world my people are worried about getting to the end of the month. Mm. You know, as, as yeah. politics go, that's a pretty good one-liner, right? Uh, and is it not the case that maybe people on the center-left who are concerned with the green transition got the cultural politics and the packaging wrong in the sense that, you know, the, 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 the middle-class 35-year-old man who drives a pickup truck away from the big cities, look at big city politicians like you and me, yep. who live in cities where the subway is subsidized and who ride bicycles because we live near work, etc., etc. And so the package is all wrong. You know, people in France were saying, you know, you, you ride in the metro, it's subsidized. Yep. I drive a car, it is taxed. I drive a truck, it is taxed. Yep. That's unfair. How do we get the politics and the branding and the packaging of this thing right when so many center-left parties around the world, in Europe, in the US, in Latin America, in Asia, are getting it completely wrong? I think we have to agree on that we were wrong. We yeah. didn't address this question. Uh, the, the, the most greenhouse gas emissions comes from cities. Perhaps cities should be the driver of this transition, not mm -hmm. the rural side of Sweden. Mm -hmm. They need cars. They have to have cars, both to get to, to the job or mm -hmm. to get their ordinary life. So we should have incentives for them to actually keep the car and uh, have their family go in by car. Mm -hmm. uh, so we, we made the wrong turn here. Uh, and that, that uh, cost our, I, I think it cost our, uh, our elections, but they promised everything. Uh, the right-wing opposition promised uh, uh, <laughs> one dollar at the pump, right. lower right. price, right. one dollar at the pump. Right. The price today, one year after the election, is higher than before the election, yeah. so right. they're quite far away from one dollar at the pump. Uh, but still, they got something right here, and we lost out on it. And I think we also know reinvented politics, so we actually give we have uh, proposed that instead of a tax cut on uh, diesel and petrol, mm -hmm. as they propose now in the government again, right. uh, that we know uh, actually goes more to the city areas where people drive their car short and, and right. very, very much. Right. <laughs> uh, right. people, people are getting money fr from that. We could give people that lives actually on the countryside mm -hmm. money in your pocket. 2,000 crowns a, a car, right. 200 uh, dollars a car. Right. You can get the money, you can use it for petrol, diesel, or whatever, or you can do whatever you want with the money, but you need your car, you should have the money. If you bo live in Stockholm, you don't need that kind of money. You should take this into account, otherwise you will have an opposition that is very hard to, to get on board. Targeted subsidies are much better than tax cuts. Yes, sir, and the black t-shirt there. 
Hi, uh, I'm Ian Hyam, a researcher at the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change here at LSE. Um, also Swedish and American, hence no accent. Um, <laughs> uh, so I wanted to ask, we've talked uh, about fossil free, uh, the first half of the phrase in your presentation, but in the second half, the welfare state. Um, you have a party leader, Magdalena Andersson, who has said that um, the government's budget is a steel bath. I don't think she meant green steel <laughs> for the welfare state. Um, she said it's an assault on welfare. I think she's right. Um, and the latest budget um, from the government has cut, fundamental institu cut funding for fundamental institutions to at least to Sweden's cultural understanding of its welfare state, like folk um building, adult education. Um, and the Social Democrats have, for various reasons, not really succeeded in government at sort of reversing the deterioration of the welfare state. I think you've done a good job of preserving it, but not necessarily of um, rolling back changes that the right wing has implemented. So since your paths back to power essentially rely on the center party, which wants to privatize many things, although they're much better on sort of much more um, centrist or, or liberal progressive on social issues, or uh, if you want to really maintain the welfare state, uh, you can give up fossil free and, and any sort of rights for immigrants and go with Sweden Democrats. So how do you maintain the welfare state aspect of fossil free? How do you, what's the path to doing that when the political options for it are so limited for the social Democrats? Oh, hard Swedish questions here. But uh -huh. still, first, I would argue that it's very hard to maintain the finance of the welfare state over time without industry being very competitive on global markets. 50% of Swedish GDP is export. We don't sell uh, bad products. We sell premium products in every segment. That's our trademark in the global market. So if we lose out on this transition, we will lose out. We will not have ordinary brown steel in the future. We will have no steel if we're not making green steel. That's my argument. That's why it's also important for the finance of the welfare state long term. Short term, it's a very different question. Uh, how do we agree with different car parties on taxation? Because if you want to maintain a kind of a welfare system, you have to have incomes. Uh, and the central party is a liberal party in Sweden uh, that are very much into both welfare and cutting taxes. And that's very hard uh, in the real economy to do. Um, so uh, my answer is that the Centre Party is on a journey, uh, I think, uh, right now in opposition. And they're being more and more clear that they're opposition to this government. And perhaps with more votes on the parties that actually maintain the welfare state, I think we can make a better negotiation than last time. That's, uh, so many more votes is easier to negotiate. Uh, less votes is easier that the other parties get to decide what will happen. That's also politics. Right there on the same row, uh, two spots to the right. Hello, my name is Karin Beckstrand, yet another Swede, total oh. dominance in the crowd. Um, so thank you for your uh, excellent overview, and I'm glad you pointed out the importance of just transition and public support for climate policy. I have two questions. One uh, concerns the pace of Sweden's emission reductions. Clearly, and you are completely right, we've done 33% 30, 30, since 1990. However, the Climate Policy Council in Sweden, which is an independent uh, council like the UK Climate Commission, have said for four years, long before the war, that Sweden's emissions needs to excel, emission reductions needs to accelerate. So during the Social Democrats, it was about, and the Green government, it was about 1 2% annually, which was good, but what was needed was about 8 to 10%. Now, the current government, as you well know, uh, the Liberal Conservatives, they, now they are estimated to increase. And my first question is, what would you do in power in the kind of policy toolbox differently? For instance, would you abandon the Swedish national goals that it may be so that the current government does? What, I mean, the, the challenges here is the transport sector, of course, and the agriculture sector. So what would you do differently to both 
secure decarbonization and get public support. My second question quickly is on, you, you rightly pointed out to the green industrial transition and the promise of that. And Sweden is a kind of leader even ever since the green people's home. What about consumption-based emission? Um, we had a public uh, commission in 2022 where all parties, I must say I was surprised, agreed that Sweden should be the first country in the world to adopt a, a consumption-based, a goal for consumption-based emissions. Now, obviously, not much happened there, but I, I would be curious what you think about the consumption-based side of emissions. Do we need to tackle them, or can we just do it through the green industrial revolution? Thanks. I get so hard questions here. What is it? The second question is, uh, I, I don't think, I don't see there is any political consensus on doing that kind of transition to consumption-based consumption emissions right now, because seven out of eight parties was actually agreeing on the goals on, on reducing the ordinary emissions from Sweden. Now parties are going away from these emissions quite rapidly. Um, so I don't think it's, uh, I think we should, I think for, for the sake of getting public support, I, should, I think we should start with the production side. If we have a strong production side that actually, an industry that wants to lead and wants to do investment, let's start with that. Continue to say that people also has a consumption side to it, but the consumption debate is sometimes too moral in my uh, uh, case because it becomes almost an individual problem. And I think this transition is not gained by doing this as just an individual problem because you have to, as a big country like Sweden, you have to have transportation, otherwise you cannot live your life. So you have to find out a solution for transportation that is sustainable. That's hard sometimes, uh, sometimes costly, but it is a societal issue, not an individual issue. So I don't think, for the sake of the environment, that we should start with the consumption-based debate right now. We should win the arg other argument first, uh, then we can go into consumption uh, 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 based emissions. The second thing, I, I, I wouldn't change the goal, but I, I think realistically, if the government really makes what they say in the budget, they will increase. For the first time in 20 years, we have a Swedish government that actually increases the emissions from CO2s, willingly, openly, uh, and that will create a very complicated situation in a few years to 2030 to reach the goals. It will be very hard if they make this policy work in Sweden. But still, I don't think we should abandon goals. We should pressure the government because before the election, they said that the, their environmental politics should be smarter and more efficient. Please, let us know which are the efforts that are smarter and more efficient that actually reduces emissions because that's what they said before the elections. Uh, so I think we should uh, hold them accountable for that. Uh, and we should find a... Uh, uh, a different way of, okay, uh, the diesel prices ha was the biggest in the world, mm -hmm. and that created this kind of problem, as you said, and it was partly because our own decisions on reductions, uh, fueling uh, the, the diesel with bioenergy that was more expensive. We should recognize that we could not continue on the same path as before. That was a bit too much for people to actually handle. So you have to find a compromise there, but not abandon the system, because you could still use Swedish forests fueling your car, not being dependent on, on Putin or, or the sheikhs in, in the Middle East. That's a smart thing if you want to transform your, your society, but it comes with a cost, and that cost cannot be too high, I think. We have time for one last question, and in the interest of geographic equity, I'm going to go to this side over here. In the back, yes. Uh, yes. Please. Hello, my name is Namata. I'm a student of Master of Public Administration at the School of Public Policy. Um, I'm curious, so with the U.S. having Inflation Reduction Act, there is talks of Europe also now reducing a lot of subsidies, and part of the backlash for the green transition comes from green technology not really being competitive at market prices, but being fueled by this and that not necessarily be fis not being fiscally prudent. What do you think is the route that Europe takes on these, on, in responding to the IRA? 
Um, so it's, it's one bit that we didn't hear. So you're saying that the, the backlash to the green transition is due to what exactly? It's due to some green technology not necessarily being commercially attractive, but I see. it being fueled because of these subsidies, and that is harming um, the fiscal uh, balance of certain economies that are dependent on, say, for example, severance taxes from coal. Okay. Um, and how do you think Europe is going to respond to that and whether that is a smart argument? Sure. First of all, let's be happy that we have a president in the U.S. that takes climate change seriously, that he actually presented a plan to, to do something to reduce emissions. I think that's good. And we should recognize that Europe had, had our subsidies on green transition before the U.S., mm -hmm. so they actually kind of doing the same thing, but in a different way than Europe. They have much more production support. We haven't had that in Europe as a tradition because that might not be long-term very good, but it's kind of buying right. factories to the U.S. in a kind of short-term way that is not, at least not in the Swedish perspective. We, sometimes we joke that Swedes are free trade Talibans mm -hmm. of the world uh, we, because we're so small mm -hmm. and we understand that our market is not enough. Mm -hmm. So our companies has to compete on world markets, so we have to be as... Uh, competitive that we can compete with everyone. So we have never tried to subsidize Swedish companies because we've understood that that can never be a successful story for us. Big countries can do different things. They can pour money into things and people want to be on their market, so perhaps it works. I think Europe should be alert that the US in some ways are subsidizing the wrong way and that some companies actually just move to the U.S. because they get money from them, exactly. and that's not a smart thing. Uh, so we have to look into that. And that breaks my heart to say, because I usually don't like subsidies uh, in this uh, way. But uh, I think we, we should not be naive in that. Uh, look at Northvolt, a battery company that built a big factory up in Kaleftio. Right. They're actually now in Canada looking what kind of incentives they can get to build a big factory there. Uh, perhaps they would have built it anyway, but I think the subsidies plays a big part in, uh, at least they're thinking of building a, a similar factory there as well. The business community hates subsidies in principle. They love principle uh, subsidies that go into their own pocket. I think everybody will agree with me. There's been a wonderful, rich, uh, uh, and instructive conversation. I wish we had more time, but we are uh, pretty much against our deadline. So uh, all that remains, I think, is to say thank you very much, Michael, and give me a big round of applause.